Not only are they great from turnover, they're absolutely elite in defensive half scoring. They're top four in that category as well. With no, with no more thanks to Mitchell Hinge, he's actually the sixth highest rated medium-sized defender in the league. So we really need to be mindful of his, I guess, ball use efficiencies and his vision. The Pies and Crows are primed for a big clash this Saturday. One team being the Pies on a six game unbeaten streak and Crows just, just on the cusp of becoming Premiership fancies. And we'll know a little bit more after this game is all said and done on Saturday. I think straight into it, we're gonna talk about the injury list that is somewhat growing and dissipating at the same time. We've got Majacek still expected to be out for another couple of weeks with that hamstring that he had incurred in the last couple of weeks. Jordan Dugowie does return. And I have a question for you guys straight up. Do you want to see Jordan Dugowie feature in a forward line at maybe a ratio of 50 to 50 and, and let players like Nick Dacos, Jack Crisp, Lockie Sullivan, Penelbury do their bit in there and then have Dugowie in the midfield in, in the case of emergency type of break glass sort of situation, if Adelaide are getting dominance early assertion in the midfield, I want to know what your thoughts are on regarding that matter. And, and I'll extend the conversation out to Ash Johnson. If, if the answer is no, would you want to see the goalie feature 80-20 like he has been for the most, most of the season featuring the midfield? And then Ash Johnson maybe fulfills that role with Jeremy Howe being out. Now, this obviously situation or conversation stems from the fact that we don't have my chef, we don't have Jeremy Howe who's out due to a groin. Which way do you want to go? Tom Mitchell is set to miss another week on the sidelines with that lingering foot issue. And I don't think it's the worst thing for the team. I said in the podcast yesterday, if you haven't watched it already, Pies, of Pies Eyes podcast episode four, I said with Tom Mitchell being out for a little bit longer, even if we just nurse him and wrap him up in cotton wool for the next couple of weeks, it gives players like Lockie Sullivan and Joe Richards or Phil McRae, any youngster, Reef McInnes, it gives them an extra opportunity to prove themselves in the AFL side and give us a large sample size before we go into the pointy end of the season where we need to make critical decisions as a as a team. So Mitchell out a couple more weeks really gives players like McRae and Sullivan in particular serious looks into the team. And people will say, well, West Coast, it's a small sample size. We pass with flying colors. But yes, it was a small sample size. Yes, it was against less opposition. But now what happens is those younger blokes, like I've just mentioned, Finlay McRae, Richards, McInnes, whoever it is, they've taken a wealth of confidence from that game and they're taking that into a massive game this weekend against the Adelaide Crows. So now we'll really get to see what our youngsters are like when they're flying high in confidence. Do they get complacent? There's a psychology behind that as well. Do they get complacent on Saturday and get shown up by their opposition? Or do they take their game to the next level and solidify their positions and make it even harder for players like Tom Mitchell to come back in the side? Bo McCreary out for another week with the concussion, so that's an obvious one. And then just quickly on Adelaide, we've got Josh Worrell who suffered a serious arm fracture on the weekend and is set for surgery, may have already had it, so he's out which is massive as far as their defensive stocks. He's been a, a key player in their back line, along with Mark Keane, who's been a revelation. Nick Murray still continues to be out with the ACL. He's not too far away. Riley Thilthorpe and Pedler. Pedler's probably a play they would have loved to have had this weekend to play on our smaller forwards. So they have their own injury woes themselves. So I think it's a level playing field when, when it's all things considering with the type of team we're able to run out with, even with the injuries we have on the list. Last time Collingwood played Adelaide last year was in round 15 at the G, a similar time slot except it was on a Sunday. The Pies actually came out with flying colours. They were up by 27 points at half time and then Taylor Walker, big, the big Texan, had something to say about the game. We went from 27 points up at half time down and ended up being down by 13 points at the, the final break, three quarter time. And if it wasn't for players like the Dacos brothers doing what they did in that game, I think Nick Dacos, he had 37 disposals, he kicked one goal, and he had 81% center bounce attendances. So we we can see that Nick Dacos is proven in the midfield against the makeup of the Adelaide Crows midfield. So obviously it's a no-brainer for Nick Dacos to feature heavily in the midfield once again. Josh Dacos had 33 disposals, one goal, and a one goal assist. So look for those players to continue their form against Adelaide. Nick Dacos in particular, he's played four games against the Crows. He's won them all, all four of them, and he's collected six Brownlow votes out of the possible 12. 
He's collected 30, he averages 32 disposals and a goal a game against the Crows. So definitely one of the teams he fancies playing against on a regular basis. In the end, in that game, Collingwood ended up winning by two points, an absolute thriller. It was, I think it was Jeremy Howe's return game from his broken arm, and he got some confidence up in that game. Unfortunately, this time around, he won't be playing, but I just remember that game being there. It was a massive day for Jeremy Howe to prove that he could, he could still perform and have an input at AFL level after that sickening arm fracture against Geelong in the opening round that year in 2023. A little bit about the Adelaide Crows profile from a stats point of view. Key team stats in the last five matches. I think the last five matches is always important and more relevant or pertinent to what it might look like over the course of the last 10 rounds. I think the last five rounds will give us a better idea to see where Adelaide are at and why I think they're such a threat and maybe will be a premiership fancy in the very near future. Hopefully not after this weekend though. So Adelaide are top four in scores from turnovers and it starts in the engine room for them. For players like Roy Laird, Jordan Dawson, Crouch, they're all leading from the front. They are all top 20 for tackles applied in the league which is naturally going to force some turnovers for your team and build from there. So that's something we'll need to be mindful of as a team and our, te our midfield team respectively is going to have to put it to them as well. They're, not only are they great from turnover, they're absolutely elite in defensive half scoring. They're top four in that category as well. With no, with no more thanks to Mitchell Hinge, he's actually the sixth highest rated medium-sized defender in the league. So we really need to be mindful of his, I guess, ball use efficiencies and his vision. And we'll talk more to matchups as well a bit later. I just want to isolate the players at an individual level first before we look at who matches up with who. And then another team that is absolutely bullish in the contested realm, their top four for contested possessions. And once again, it starts with Laird, Dawson, and Crouch. But then also being followed up by players like Jake Saligo and Rankin, who are also averaging close to 10 contested possessions per game. So they've got some beasts in there, along with some young, hungry bulls that are wanting to have an imprint in the contested element themselves. This one probably comes as no surprise, but Adelaide are number one for marks inside 50 rate. And they are also number one for marks in 50 in general. So that marks in 50 rate is relative to their inside 50s, how many marks they're taking versus the the total volume of the, the, the times they're going inside 50. They rank number one there, and they rank number one for absolute marks inside 50 for the game. And that's with players like Taylor Walker, who, who is taking three marks inside 50 per game. And then you've got Darcy Fogarty, who also has some, uh, I guess, abilities himself and can take great marks and is a great leading player as well. And the next stat sort of ties in with the, the, the marks inside 50 there. They are top two for scoring shots per inside 50. So for every two inside 50s, they're averaging a scoring shot. I think they're sitting at about 50% of their, their inside 50s. They're getting a scoring shot out of it, which is similar to Collingwood. In the game between the Crows and Brisbane in that Sunday twilight game, it was a draw. It was a great game. Jordan Dawson and Rankin were absolutely outstanding for the Crows. Jordan Dawson had 37 disposals, 11 inside 50s, 2 goal assists, 10 score involvements, and running at an 85% disposal efficiency, taking the majority of the coaches' votes for the game. He's back at his all-time best. Last year, he was in Brownlow form. People were really questioning, I guess, his role early this season and his ball use. He's completely done a 180 and he's back to where he should be as the skipper for Adelaide with all the ability that he comprises of. And then Isaac Rankin is just becoming sneakily one of the best players in the league. He had 24 disposals, three goals, two goal assists, 14 contested possessions and 33% center bounce attendances. So they're looking to throw him in the middle a little bit more. I foresee that 33% that thirty potentially bumping up to something like 50% for Collingwood. I just think if your best players on the ground should typically reside in the middle when that center bounce starts at the start of the game. So maybe we'll see more of that. Darcy Fogarty kicked four goals. Hasn't had an amazing season, but could be the kickstart he needed just in time for Collingwood, of course. And Matt Crouch has been amazing within his own right. Twenty, He had 28 disposals, 29 pressure, uh, pressure acts, 
13 tackles. He looks completely reinvigorated himself. He was on the outer for the majority of the season last year. It seems like Matt, Matthew Nix has got some buy-in from these players and they're applying pressure and building their game off that. Similar to what I think Collingwood do really well is they build their game based off pressure. But Matt Crouch seems to be reaping the benefits and is, is feature, featuring in most games and not this year. Adelaide scored 59 points from turnover, which is a massive number in any game against any sort of opposition. And then they only conceded 25 points from the defensive half while also scoring 42 points themselves. And they're only conceding 20 points from defensive half per game, which is second in the league. So they've got a bunch of stats that really point towards their almost ready to have a tilt at the flag. If they weren't last year, obviously a few games didn't go their way by the time the siren went. This year, if they get the results and, and hang in there and have, and find themselves lingering around the top six, they might be a sneak. And, and that's why we have to be on high alert as a, as a Collingwood team and a Collingwood army this weekend to be cognizant that this team is not going to be walked over. They're a great opposition. They have great stats to back that up. So let's see where this one goes. We Hopefully, we're ready for the challenge. I guess we'll talk a little bit about some of the VFL impressions as well. Collingwood, the Collingwood VFL side played against the Northern Bullants and unfortunately lost 55 to 48. There were 16 VFL listed players for Collingwood that day. I think it was on Saturday, uh, which, was a, which was a season high, obviously, with the injuries and the youngsters stepping up. That was always going to happen. Funnily enough, or interestingly enough, Collingwood were up... 42 to 19 at the final break at three quarter time, ended up losing 55 to 48. I think the Northern Bullens ended up kicking six goals to one or something that last quarter to run away with the game. It was a game where Collingwood enjoyed more inside 50s. They had 54 compared to Northern Bullens 40. Uh, the difference was Northern Bullens went in and scored 50% of the time from their inside 50s, which makes a big difference. As far as player performers, Charlie Dean is building a nice case for AFL at some point. He had 27 disposals, 14 marks. So with Jeremy Howe out, we talked about Ash Johnson maybe rolling into the forward line or whether that's Jordan Dugowie. What if Billy Frampton is the surprise package and he goes forward and then maybe we bring Charlie Dean in to play that backline position? So these are sort of the permutations that Fly will be going through. There's a bunch of options to consider. Ash Johnson himself had 11 disposals and kicked three goals. So I don't suspect if Billy Frampton was to swing forward, I wouldn't suspect AJ to go back line because he's played forward line this weekend and kicked three goals. So I think AJ's opportunity lies in if Jordan Dugowie doesn't play predominantly forward this weekend, I think Ash Johnson gets another chance against Adelaide at AFL level. Nathan Kruger was impressive. 11 disposals, one goal, five tackles. Building his case slowly, slowly. I'd like to see him uh, he feature in the second half of the season for Collingwood. I think he's got a lot of potential and a lot of pressure that he can bring to our team. And finally, Will Parker, that Category B rookie, former cricketer or elite level cricketer, really. He had 16 disposals, 5 marks, and the match report talks to his composure across the halfback flank. And he, the fact that he's not afraid of contest, despite not actually going through the entirety of the his first AFL preseason, coming in quite late, they're really they're really impressed with his body of work within the contest. So keep an eye on that. We'll see where his career goes. He's making some positive inroads early on. And finally, let's go into how I think, or how do we think Collingwood could possibly win this weekend? I think a big one from the the start will be intercept marks. Brisbane had enjoyed a lot of success from turning over Brisbane's uh, Adelaide's ball. They had plus 14 intercept marks compared to the Crows. So I think Brisbane had 24 intercept marks for the game compared to Adelaide's 10. So can Billy, Billy Frampton and Darcy Moore really feed off that? I can't quite remember the game. Maybe Adelaide were a bit lackluster at times when going inside 50 or maybe transitioning from their defensive half and maybe on the wing they got caught up. Dealing with Jack Payne and Harris Andrews, I can't quite remember. But Collingwood are also a top four side in contested possessions. So like I said earlier, it's going to be a massive battle in the engine room between Nick Dacos, Jack Chris Pendles versus Roy Laird, Jordan Dawson and Crouch. So that would be the, the massive focal point for the game. And I think the game is won and lost out of that area. Similar to Adelaide, Collingwood do score really well when going inside 50. They're roughly at the 50% mark every time 
So every two times they go inside 50, they're looking to score as well. So that's an interesting stat. Similar profiles to a certain extent when it comes to Collingwood and Adelaide. So we'll see some similar, I guess, styles in the game as it, as it transpires and unfolds. Collingwood last week scored seven goals from center bounces in the first half, which talks to our vastly improved work coming out of the stoppages and scoring heavily from them. Nick Dacos has been a big part of that, scoring his last three goals from stoppage contests uh, directly. Two against Carlton in the stoppage around the forward line, and then the last one was against West Coast from the middle, where he pretty much won his own ball and just followed up on a ricochet and, and kicked it from 55-odd. So that's that's where a lot of our success has come from recently. And with that all being considered, Crows did concede 50 points from stoppages versus Brisbane. So I'm pretty sure players like Nick Dacos and Jack Chris will be licking their lips around the contest. And even our small forwards like Bobby Hill and maybe even Lockie Schultz to get involved will be looking to score very heavily from that realm. The Pies also defend very well from turnover. We're top two in the last five matches, whereas very early on in the season, we were horrific from turnover, but it was more about where we were, where were we turning over the ball on the field. Against Sydney, St Kilda, GWS, a lot of our turnovers were happening in our own defensive half, whereas now our turnovers are happening further up the ground, which makes it easier for the team defense to set up and structure and ensure that we don't get scored going the other way too heavily. So that's probably what, what that talks to when I try to, I guess, elucidate that point regarding that turnover, defending the turnover stat. And then I just want to continue seeing still side bottom thrive in that halfback flank role, similar to players like Joe Richards and Finlay McRae, who played really well against West Coast. It's one thing to play well, but to play well against West Coast at the halfback flank for the first time for Saidi, there might be a bit of a false economy, but nevertheless, it's a it's a wealth of confidence he would take from that game. And let's see if Steely can build on that in the game against Adelaide on Saturday. I think he's got the ability and the, the characteristics that are needed to play that role. He has played majority of his last couple seasons as a defensive winger. I've always plotted his his defensive leading patterns and, and habits. So I think he's got both sides and he's he's a great ball user. So he ticks a lot of bo- sorry, excuse me. He ticks a lot of boxes when it comes to fulfilling that role to the its greatest ability. So we'll see. Hopefully he can continue to grow on that. And finally, I know I said finally after I said how do Collingwood win, but finally I guess when it comes to one-on-one matchups, I think Braden Maynard maybe gets an assignment on Taylor Walker. He's bullish in a one-on-one contest, so I think Braden Maynard would love and relish that opportunity. Billy Frampton versus Darcy Fogarty, and then that will hopefully leave Darcy more for Elliot Hemmelberg and have allowed Darcy Moore to play loose and do what he does best as that interceptor for the team. I think with Isaac Quainor, he'll probably get a fine balance of Josh Rochelle and Isaac Rankin when Rankin is resting forward and when Rochelle goes into middle and vice versa. I think that's Quainor's best matchup for the weekend. And finally, I want to see whether it's Joe Richards or Lockie Schultz to disrupt Hinge's ball use off the halfback flank. I think that will be probably Lockie Schultz's main assignment for the weekend. And, and if he can do something about that and limit Mitchell Hinge's impact on the game, it'll go a long way for Collingwood winning the game. I'm really looking forward to this game. I think Collingwood and Adelaide typically match up very well and always have really thrilling games, offensive-minded games with great individual players on both sides. And I'm also doing a post-game show, which will start at 4.30. I think that's enough time to go from the game finishing and transition into that post-game show. If not, I'll change it, but be sure to... Jump in, tune in, and maybe we can unpack the game together and go from there. All the best, guys. Take it easy. Bye.